Um, our reading, our reading this morning is John chapter three and verse thirteen to seventeen, and it begins John three, verse thirteen to seventeen. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him and in a little while we'll look at that famous verse john 3 16 together let's pray our father god we just rejoice to be before you this morning and to have your word laid out for us and we pray that in the hearing of your word we may hear your voice and hear it speak into the particularity of our own lives that we may be conscious that you are here and not only ourselves so quieten us in heart and mind to engage with you through your word, speak to us. And speak to the little ones uh, in the lounge. Speak to us all, that we might be conscious you were here. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a small seaside town in Northern Ireland called Bangor. Now, I won't ask you to put your hand up if you've been there, but I really like being in Bangor. And coming out of Bangor on the Belfast Road, about a hundred yards off the road, there is a large barn, which I'll ask Ian to put up for us if he would. I hope you're able to see it there. Now, ever since I was a child, um, it's had these words emblazoned all over the side of it. Uh, now, of course, when I was very young, I didn't know what they meant. I, I knew it was something religious, because in Northern Ireland, there's something religious all over the place. You know, but I saw these words on this barn. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's John 3.16 in the King James Version. And this has been called one of the Bible's most famous verses. And it characterizes the gospel as a message composed of three chords that are woven together to illustrate God's great love for sinners. Now, I'm thrilled to be preaching on John 3.16 because we have been listening about sin for the last three weeks, and it's very heavy, although essential and necessary. Um, but now we're going to look at the gospel and look at how the Lord has responded to us as sinners. And I want to look at these three chords that, as I say, are woven together to illustrate the Father's love for us. And the first chord is the Father's love in sending his Son. John writes, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And he starts the Gospel of John 2 with a similar thought. He begins by saying, we have seen the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Now, when we think of all the ways that God might come to his estranged people, who he still loves, and who still bear his image, how better than to send his perfect image, his firstborn son? Christian theology calls uh, the coming of the divine son in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, his incarnation, which means his enfleshment. And we sing of this in Hark the Herald Angels Sing at Christmas. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. 
So we sing about this at Christmas. <clears throat> and so the first great truth about Jesus in John 3.16 is God's love present in his incarnation. And it's helpful, for it reminds us that while we have Bibles and believe them to be God's word, God doesn't just reveal himself in sentences, but in his Son. And so the question is, why did he do that? And the answer is to show us the Father's love. That's why Jesus came. Now let me give you an illustration from the literary world. You may have heard of the novelist Dorothy Sayers. Again, I won't ask you to put your hand up, but she was very popular in the first half of the 20th century. She wrote detective stories. And as it happens, she was one of the first women ever to attend Oxford University. And the main character in her stories was a chap called Lord Peter Whimsey. And he was an aristocratic sleuth and a single man. But at one point in her novels, a new character appears, a lady called Harriet Vane. And she is described intriguingly as a writer of mystery novels and one of the first women to go to Oxford. Eventually in the novels, she and Peter fall in love and marry. Now, who was Harriet Vane? Well, many fans believe Sayers looked into the world she had created. She fell in love with its main character and wrote herself into the story to save him. Now, that's touching. You're meant to be going, oh. But it's not nearly as touching or nearly as moving as the truth of the incarnation. Because God has looked into the world he has made, and loving you and loving me, he saw our lostness, and he had pity on us, and he wrote himself into history as history's leading figure, Jesus Christ, to show us, to show you individually and me that he loves us. God's only son came to demonstrate the Father's love for you and for me. That's why he came. And it's important that we see that it was for me that he came. I'm not just saying this is for, well, everybody and anybody who shows a casual interest. No, he came for you. He came for me. And that's the point of the parable of the lost sheep. Ninety-nine were left while the one lost sheep was searched for. And Jesus came to search for that one lost sheep. And you are that one lost sheep. You and I, in all the individuality of our persons, Jesus came for us. He came for you because you were that lost sheep. Now, what an incredible story then that the gospel is, except that unlike Sayers and her books, which were the figment of her imagination, this is true. This really happened. Jesus came for you. And if I don't impress that upon you and you don't feel the power of that for you individually, I have failed miserably. Because that's what has happened. You are the one lost sheep and you have been pursued, you have been searched for by the shepherd. And how wonderful a thing is that. So the first chord of the gospel, the Christian message, the Bible's sharpest point, if you like, is the Father's love for you and sending his Son that you might know that and that you might embrace that love and you might know it transform you as an individual. That's the first chord of, of, of this message that illustrates the Father's love in John 3.16. But of course, there's a second one. And the second gospel chord in 3.16 is the love of the Son in substituting himself for us. 
we read, those for whom Jesus came shall not perish. Now, how do we get from shall not perish to substitution? Well, it's because throughout John, those who avoid the death that sin deserves do so because Jesus substituted himself for them. He died their death for them. And I'm here to proclaim, Jesus has died your death for you. He has died that death that sin's death incurs. He went to the cross. He died that death. He didn't do it just to be an example of self-sacrificial love for anybody that happens to be looking on or hearing about it. No, he took your sin, your sin individually, to the cross and there died for your sins on that very cross. Now, let me give you two examples from John of the kind of substitution I'm talking for, because I don't want you to think this is one of Kieran's ideas. What do I know? I'm only picking up on what the gospel has to say. Well, in the gospel of John, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, who does what? He gives his life to the sheep. He sacrifices his life that they might live. And that's what a shepherd did, quite literally. A shepherd would sit and guard the sheep from wolves and others that would come and maybe either kill or take the sheep. And so to be a shepherd wasn't like we imagine walking along with a crook looking all ethereal and dreaming dreams. Not at all. It was a tough and a hard and a threatening job. But Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and I've given my life for the sheep. He sacrifices his life that they might live. But then, rather strangely, in the same gospel, he is called the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Now, the only Lamb that clears the debt that sin incurs is a sacrificed Lamb. It was brought and it was offered in the temple as a substitute for each worshiper. And, you know, one of the most basic assumptions in the Bible is that sin or wrong must be paid for. And not only is God like this, but we are too. Now, we might think, well, all sin doesn't have to be paid for. We can just forgive others. We can drop the whole thing when others offend us. But even if we forgive someone, now think about this. Even if we forgive someone who wrongs us, we still have to accept the loss or bear the cost to our reputation or even to our bank balance. And so when the prodigal son returns home and says to the father, in effect, I'll pay for what I've done. I mean, I'm, 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 you know, this isn't exactly what he said, but I'll pay for what I've done. I'll work hard. I'll become as a servant. I'll make sure you get back everything um, you, know, you deserve. And, the, you know, it's true he doesn't actually have to do that. The father doesn't want him to do that. Um, but somebody has to pay for his antics. Somebody has to pay. The cost of his antics don't just evaporate. Not at all. The father takes the loss. But here it is. Here is the wonder of substitution. You do it for someone you love which is why Jesus died for us. He loved us, and he gave himself for us. Now, let me choose another illustration, and this is another literary illustration. But bear with me so you get the sense and the power of what is being said here. Uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite writers is Charles Dickens. And by far, my favorite book is A Tale of Two Cities. Now, I don't know if you've read A Tale of Two Cities, but hey, a hand shoots up. Then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Because in A Tale of Two Cities, there's two men, Charles Darnay and Sidney Carton. And both of these men love the same woman. Lucy Manette is her name. But Lucy chooses to marry Charles and not Sidney. But later, as it happens in the French Revolution, Charles is thrown into prison, the Bastille prison, to await the guillotine. 
Sidney, who is a similar build to, Ch build to Charles, visits him in prison, drugs him, and has him carried out to freedom. Now, when a young seamstress on death row herself realizes that Sidney is taking Charles's place, she is so moved that she wants Sidney to, to, to sit and hold her hand to give her strength. But what is it that moves her? It's his loving, willing, substitutionary sacrifice. And so Dickens finishes his book and with these words, and they're on the last page, and there are no other words on the page. These words appear in the middle of the last page of A Tale of Two Cities. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. That's what Jesus has done on the cross. He has laid down his life for your sins and my sins individually. And in the doing of it, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ has died for us. For you and for me, as undeserving as we know ourselves to be. And to see this, to see this in the gospel and to accept this, to accept this love, changes everything. It changes everything in the life that receives it. Truly at the risk of sounding like a top of the pop, you know, love changes everything. But this love truly changes everything. When you receive it and embrace it, it becomes a power in our lives. How amazing. How amazing. Now this brings us to the third chord of the gospel. The third chord. And it's God's loving restoration of all things. God's loving restoration. What do I mean? Well, in our verse, John says, those who shall not perish have eternal life or everlasting life, if it's from the King James Version. And, and when we hear that phrase, we naturally think in terms of time. You know, everlasting life. It's life that goes on a very, very long time. But actually, to think only chronologically, to think only in terms of time, massively undersells what John and the other New Testament writers mean. What John calls eternal life, Matthew, Mark, and Luke call the kingdom. But actually, both are references to the future. We tend to assume they're references to now. And they are in the sense that we can, we can as it were, you know, uh, embrace those truths and begin to know the power of them now. But actually, the focus is into the future. And the New Testament calls this ultimate future the restoration or the renewal of all things. Jesus uses the word renewal. Peter uses the words restoration. They have this absolute fixed notion of what was to come. And the gospel, in a way, is, is intended to receive people into that kingdom now that they might live in that kingdom throughout and beyond that. And so we tend to think that death is like a stone wall and we're running through life and we hit the wall and then we just fall to the ground. But as I've said before, we discover at that wall a door. And when the door is opened, we find a hand reached through to take us by our hand and lead us through into the renewal and the restoration of all things. Now, the New Testament vision of the future is also a gift of God's love. It is of a new heaven coming down to a new earth. And so there are things we can say about it. If it's a new heaven uniting with a new earth, there will be both a spirituality and a physicality about it. Spiritually, God will again be among us. When we think ahead into that future, God will again be among us. As he was in Eden, so he will be in Eden restored, which is how Revelation thinks of glory. And of, he and of heaven. 
and there will be a physicality to it as well. We'll see things in heaven. We will hear things in heaven, feel things in heaven. We will smell things in heaven, and we will definitely taste things in heaven. Now, why am I saying that with such energy? Because that happens to hit me more powerfully than the other one. Well, not at all. What's the first thing we unite at in glory? It's a banquet. Isn't it a banquet? Yeah. And so there's a physicality about these things. But there will also be a purity about it all too. As it's where righteousness reigns. And so sin will no longer cast shadows of transience and death on things. Love will love. Or in the words, again, of Revelation, a day will come when the dwelling of God is with man. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Every tear. And death will be no more. I'm quoting Revelation. Death will be no more, and neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. And why? Because the writer says the former things will have passed away. He's talking negatively about what we're thinking about positively, the renewal and the restoration of all things, which is an extraordinary thing. And even restored is how Revelation sees glory and heaven. And so if we had our Bibles, if I had my Bible written on one long continuous scroll that ran all the way around this church and began here and went round and, and sort of ended here, if I was to staple the beginning of my Bible to the end of my Bible, there's a garden in both bits. The Garden of Eden and Eden Restored. It's as though God has been at work in calling each individual life into this renewal and restoration of all things where where once it was ruined and once it was uh, you know occupied by uh, difficult and, and deadly and dangerous things then it becomes the very habitation of god with all his people and the sun with all his people and all rushing up wanting to thank him at once you know, that's what glory is. It's not to be feared, it's to be pondered, reflected upon, and anticipated. Because this is what the Lord Jesus has won for. Isn't the gospel great? You know, I know I say that all the time, but come on. It, it really, it, where else are you going to find hope on planet Earth, particularly today, the way you find hope in this gospel? I find hope in this gospel. It's one of the few things these days that puts a smile on my face, and, 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 and you know, uh, uh, yeah, what a gospel. And so, here are the three chords of the gospel that illustrate the Father's love. The sending of Jesus for you and me. His death for us on the cross for you and for me. And the future hope that he now offers everyone who will receive him. Now, how can this hope be ours? How can this be something you haven't only heard about, but have actually a stake in? You know what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to make this as, as, as earthy and real as possible. How can we become those that aren't only interested in this, but, but, but have this as our own inheritance, personally? Well, whoever believes, whoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes. Now let's be clear what makes faith effective. What makes faith effective is not a quality to it that God measures on some heavenly barometer. Because we do that with ourselves. We say, I believe, but, oh, I'm not really sure. And, and we start questioning. We treat belief and faith as though somehow it's the work that we do that somehow triggers everything that God has done as an advantage for ourselves. Not at all. Faith works quite simply 
and for no other reason than because of its object or who we place faith in. In other words, Jesus. And so you can have faith like a mountain or you can have faith like a mustard seed. Think of the difference between those two, a mountain and a mustard seed. Jesus chose that one because it's barely visible. But if it's real and genuine faith, if it's the kind of faith that turns away from ourselves and turns to the Lord Jesus Christ, even if it is teeny weeny mustard seed faith, if it's genuine faith and it's directed to him, like the lady in the Gospels who had the issue of blood, she'd been to so many quacks and she'd got nowhere. How much faith do you think she had in somebody else being able to help her? But she comes across Jesus. I suppose she thinks, well, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. He's making a difference to other people's lives. I'll believe in him too. But when she believes in him with her teeny weeny mustard seed faith, not faith that God's measuring at some heavenly barometer to see if the quality of it is great enough, rather that she's looking to him, and in looking to him, she trusts him. And he feels power leave him, and she feels virtue and power enter her. This faith, when directed toward Jesus Christ, releases all that he has achieved and the advantage of it, the benefit of it, for ourselves that trust him and believe him. You know, Sheena and I got the, you know, I, I, I've often thought faith is like a key, isn't it? It's like a key. It's the key that opens the door, if you like. And Sheena and I got the chance on holiday some months ago to visit George Washington's family home. We were invited to Washington, the city, by some friends. And they had laid on several things for us. We went to George Washington's house. It's called Mount Vernon. And I found it, you know, being a bit interested in history, I found it incredible. And when we were in the hallway at the beginning of our tour, and because I have a very big mouth and can't be shut up, I was standing in the hallway and I noticed this little glass cabinet on the wall. And inside the glass cabinet, a very old key. I mean, one of those keys that's that length. It looked really rusty, really, really rusty. And I asked the lady giving the tour, what's the significance of the key? Because it wasn't mentioned in all that she had to say. Well, she says it was given to George Washington by the Marquis de Lafayette, who came over from France and helped Washington win the American Civil War. And I said, well, why on earth would he give him a key? She said, that's the key to the Bastille prison. The Bastille prison. That's where everyone went in the French Revolution that was awaiting Madame Guillotine to have their heads cut off for being, you know, um, incredible. To see that key there. To see that key. But listen. Just as the Marquis de Lafayette came from France to alter the course of American history and Washington trusted him and won the Civil War, so too Jesus Christ has come from the Father. He has paid our debt of sin by his sacrifice and, and offers us transformed hopes and transformed lives. But, but like Washington with Lafayette, we have to trust him. It's whoever believes that shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's whoever believes. You know, keys can lock us up or release us. And faith is the key that reaches out to receive the release that only Jesus can give, no one else. And if we're honest, life can sometimes feel like being locked up. I think we've all known that. And um, some past event or, or present affliction or future worry won't leave us in peace and we feel locked up into that circumstance. Let your mustard seed faith call out to the Lord Jesus Christ. He died and rose again and says, come on to me, all you who are heavy and laden and burdened 
and I will give you rest. That's what he's calling to every single person in this world. He says, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. You will be free indeed. And I call upon you, I urge you, I press upon you the need to believe for yourself in this gospel. Because through this gospel, you encounter the living, reigning Christ. And he will transform and change your life. And, and, and this is what's on offer to us. And, and how wonderful a thing it is. If there's anybody that's been touched by this message this morning, not because I gave it, but because you've sensed the Lord speak to you in it and through it, please come and see me at the end of this service. And I mean the end of this service that finishes. Because as it happens, I've got my COVID booster uh, straight after this service. But I do have some time. Come to me. Come to me. And speak to me and share with me your wish to receive this Jesus Christ. And you will discover for yourself that everything I have said is true. That you're not being lied to. That Jesus Christ is alive and not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to him to know life and power in their lives. Father God, we do thank you for your gospel message. We thank you for the way it has transformed us and our prayer is that we'll continue to transform others and and if somebody has been moved this morning lord make them come and we can talk and share and pray that they might know you the living reigning lord and i know that you came for them that you died for them and that you have prepared a place for them and will return to receive them just in the way you said you would the disciples be with us lord we pray in jesus name now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and companionship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us this day and forevermore. Amen.